A narrative of the battles of Quatre Bras and Waterloo with the defence of Hougamon by Private Matthew Clay and read by Stephen Davis. I, being in the light company of the Third Foot Guards, was with the Coldstream Company under Lieutenant Colonel Macdonnell as Light Infantry of the 2nd Brigade, commanded by Major General Sir John Bing. It was early on the morning of the 16th of June, 1815, we marched from a chateau situated in the environs of the Park of Enghien. From whence having marched some miles, we halted near bran le comte for a considerable time, owing to some arrangements that were being made relative to our future movements, as we supposed amongst ourselves. We afterwards marched on without knowing anything as to our destination, until we arrived in sight of Nivelle, when we ascended a field on our left, took off our knapsacks, and sent out watering parties. Expecting to remain there for the night, we could then hear distinctly the report of cannon fire, the meaning of which we were no longer at a loss to find out. Having now received the order to march with all speed, we proceeded accordingly, leaving our watering parties to join us on our way. We marched through the town, before mentioned, and were joined by our watering party, the man belonging to my mess having been fortunate enough to obtain a little table beer for us instead of water was most gladly received by us. We then marched hastily on. The sound of cannon and musketry became more distinct, and being nearer at hand, we also met with some wounded, and as we approached the field of action, our two light companies led off onto the field on the left, and the first foot guards entered the wood Bossu on the right of the road, where I now leave them and confine myself to the two light companies commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Macdonnell, as above. We now loaded our muskets and very hastily advanced up the rising ground in the open field. The shot from the enemy now whizzing amongst us, we quickly attained the summit and bringing our left shoulders forward, the enemy retiring before us. We had now arrived near to a building, against the walls of which the shots from the guns of the enemy, intended for us, were freely rebounding. Being just within range of their guns, our skilful commander led us through an enclosed yard where several bodies of the enemy's cavalry lay, slain previous to our arrival. Also, an adjoining garden, a short distance to our right, which concealed our advance from the enemy's view, and passing singly through a gap in the hedge, at the extremity of the garden nearest to the enemy, we immediately formed in the field into which we had entered, and were at the same time joined by our light guns, which had been brought round the outside of the enclosure through which we had passed. They immediately opened their fire upon the enemy, who hastened their retreat, and we, at the same time advancing, after having advanced some considerable distance through the rye that was trampled down, and passed over numerous bodies of the slain, more particularly near to a fence enclosing a house and garden, which clearly showed there had been a very severe contest for the possession of it. I particularly noticed a young officer of the 33rd Regiment laying amongst the slain. His bright scarlet coat and silver lace attracted my attention when marching over his headless body. For the most part, English, Brunswickers and Highlanders, more especially of the latter, we halted for a short time whilst our brigade of guns, which, a little further to the left, exchanged shots with the enemy. Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood, being in command of the 3rd Regiment Light Company, took the opportunity of placing himself in front of the same, and with cheerful countenance and manner addressed us, saying, Now men, let us see what you are made of. We continued pursuing the enemy over the slain which were thickly spread around us. By this time our commander found it necessary to form us into square to oppose the enemy's cavalry, who were constantly menacing us on our advance. Our square being compactly formed and prepared to receive cavalry, their cavalry now bearing off, the enemy's artillery would alternately annoy us with their shells which were skilfully directed, but were equally skilfully avoided through the tact of our commander. Our movements now for a time were performed whilst in square, for the reason above stated. Being drawn compactly together, the officers being in the centre, I had frequent opportunities of observing the keen watchfulness of our commander. He being mounted on his charger could, undoubtedly from his elevated position, distinctly see the preparation of the enemy for the renewal of attack on us by the united force of the infantry, cavalry, and artillery. Being foiled by the timely movements of our square, ever obedient to the commander, 
we escape the destructive efforts of the well-directed shells of the enemy, who, no doubt having observed our repeated escapes from the galling fire of their artillery, their cavalry now menaced us more daringly, and prevented our taking fresh ground until their artillery had thrown their shells amongst us. By this means, we had a more narrow escape than before, being compelled to remain longer in our position to resist cavalry. I, being one of the outward rank of the square, can testify as to the correct aim of the enemy, whose shells having fallen to the ground and exploded within a few paces of the rank in which I was kneeling, a portion of their destructive fragments in their ascent passing between my head and that of my comrade next in the rank. Its force and tremulous sound causing an unconscious movement of the head not to be forgotten in haste. The evening was now approaching, and with loud cheers we drove the enemy before us, who now took up their position for the night on a rising ground adjoining the wood. The firing gradually ceased, and their campfires were quickly lighted. We were then extended in line and laid down on our arms amongst the trampled corn, all being quiet and diligently watching during the night. The only sounds we heard arose from the suffering wounded in their different languages, who lay as they had fallen, some in the adjoining wood, others distant, and others nearer to us, in different parts of the plain, or cornfield, where we were posted. The deep and heavy groans of the more faint and expiring, with the loud calls for water from others less exhausted, whilst many hundreds of slain lay on every side, a very formidable and watchful enemy before us. But this is only a very faint picture of the night of the 16th of June 1815. We passed on to the plains of Quatre Bras. Being now settled in our position for the night, and there being numbers of wounded men laying close around my post, begging for water and assistance, my comrade, with myself being on duty, were also suffering severely from thirst. He, being the older soldier of the two, proposed to keep watch whilst I attended to the wounded, and I went, in the dark, in search of water, having groped my way about among the sufferers and placed them in as easy a position as I could, many having fallen in very uneasy postures and being altogether helpless, increased their sufferings, some having fallen with their legs doubled under them, others with the weight of the dead upon them, and the like, having afforded them all the ease that lay in my power, and all being quiet around us, taking a camp kettle from off the knapsack of a dead man, wended my way a short distance to the rear of our posts, where I had observed the appearance of water when advancing after the enemy on the afternoon previous, and finding a narrow channel of water in a ditch, which I traced to the wood, from where our brave comrades the first guards had driven the enemy in the evening. There was a pond from which I filled my kettle and drank freely from its contents, enjoying it much, whilst in the dark I found my way back to my post, where my comrade and the poor sufferers from wounds gladly partook of the contents of the same. I believe it was after this that some slight move amongst the troops in our line caused the enemy to commence a fire of musketry in the dark, and it was reported that several of our men were wounded by them. There was one man in my company whom I did not see after, all being again quiet, just before the dawn of morning. My comrade wished me to go again for water, which I did. On my arriving at the pond, the light of day just enabled me to see that in and around lay the bodies of those who had fallen in the combat on the evening previous, and the liquid we had partaken of was dyed with their blood, for so I saw the remainder. I do not remember whether I returned with the further supply, although I am quite aware that I lost all relish for any more of it, having hastened back to my post, being just in time to fall in a standing column, as the light disclosed us to the view of the enemy. From our position in column, we proceeded to our different posts, keeping as much as possible concealed from the enemy, and, having a watchful eye upon them, were prepared to oppose their advance. The enemy not being disposed to disturb us, except by a few straggling shots from their skirmishers, which were mostly brought upon us by some of our German allies, who appeared desirous to be at them. We took up our position within a loose sort of hedge dividing the wood from the rye field, which we had previously occupied, and where the contest had been most severe. The spot where we were posted was in a hollow track within the wood. 
we lay on the rising bank covered by the loose fence. This, I presume, is the place where the grenadier guards met with such a severe reception from the enemy, when in pursuit of them from the wood on entering the cornfield, on the slope from the field to the hollow track within the wood, the dead bodies of the same regiment were laying very thick on the ground. All the wounded that were found were collected together, and with the blankets of the dead, under the shade of the trees in the wood, in the hope of their being safely taken to the hospital. But unfortunately, a later hour in the day, we were suddenly withdrawn from our position, without being able to render any further assistance to them. We found our way through the wood, and, having entered a close or field on the opposite side from the plain or cornfield which we were marching across, when suddenly an aide-de-camp rode up to the commanding officer, and apprised him that we were approaching the enemy's lines. They being concealed behind a distant hedge, we immediately brought our left shoulders forward and stepped off in double quick time until we reached the wood's side, and continued to move on quickly until we were more concealed from the enemy. We shortly entered a narrow and rather deep lane, where we met a party of English light dragoons under the charge of a sergeant, going to fetch the wounded from where I have before described. We now proceeded along a footpath across a field, the situation being higher than the lane, and from whence we could distinguish, at a distance to our right, a body of English cavalry dismounted standing by their horses. We had now arrived at a brook which crossed our path, and being extremely thirsty, for the moment forgot the danger we were in, and drank most eagerly from it. Being a little refreshed, we passed on until we had overtaken some of our returning troops, when we halted for a short time by the roadside near Janap. We then proceeded until near the plains of Waterloo. We then passed along a path through some fields to our left, where we again halted for some time. A heavy thunderstorm came on, and the enemy, having gained ground on us, we marched on until we reached the summit of an eminence in a clover field before us. There we halted and took off our knapsacks, the storm still continuing with dreadful violence, and we thinking of remaining there for the night, were ordered to pitch our blankets, they having been prepared for such purpose, having six buttonholes with loops of small cords and lined with pieces of duck at each corner also on each side of the centre. The company, having been previously told off in fours, cast lots to see which two of each four should unpack their knapsacks and pitch their blankets. Myself being one of the unlucky two, we fixed our muskets perpendicular at each end of the blanket, passing the knob of the ramrods through the two buttonholes at the corresponding corner of each blanket, then slipping the loop of the cord round the muzzle of both muskets, keeping them upright at the full stretch of the blankets and pegged down the bracing cords at the opposite ends, while the other two men, first at one end, then at the other, tightened and pegged down the lower corners of the blankets, the upper edges being kept close, all four creeping under the cover, taking the remainder of our equipment. The storm still continuing with equal force, and covering became very speedily soaked with wet, and by this time the shots from the enemy's artillery began to fall among us. Our guns being in position on the rising ground near us, opened on the enemy. We were immediately called upon to assemble, and those whose knapsacks were already packed, instantly fell into the ranks and hastened down to a large orchard, belonging to the Chateau of Hougamon, leaving us wet blanket men to strike, pack up and follow them, which we found to be no easy matter. The blankets being exceedingly wet, and the buff straps of the knapsacks being very slippery, were, when open to so heavy a storm, very difficult to pack and slip on the shoulders, the straps becoming quite or nearly useless. Having eventually succeeded in putting on my knapsack, I hastened after my comrades, although unacquainted with the way they had proceeded to the orchard, where I perceived our artillery were keeping up a brisk fire. I descended the hill a short distance below, and, stooping, ran under the range of their shots until having passed their front, where, on arriving at an opening in a fence on the inside of which was a deep ditch, and the ground being wet, I could distinguish that my company had gone that way. In making a spring to leap the ditch, 
the ground being slimy, and the increased weight of my wet blanket caused me to slip into the same, which being neck deep, I found very great difficulty in getting out, which having succeeded in accomplishing, I quickly joined my company, who were extended along the upper side of the orchard in a shallow ditch, sheltered by a high bushy hedgerow, which separated us from the enemy, who were close at hand. The weather still continuing very stormy and had become very cold, from which we suffered much during the night, as we remained in our position and without food, we having been deprived of our rations, which did not arrive early enough to be distributed amongst us. At the time of our sudden retreat from the wood, we were kept continually on the alert, being frequently visited by a field officer during the darkness of the night, and who invariably asked some questions and received answers from one or other as he rode past in rear of our line, within the hedgerow enclosing the orchard. When daylight appeared, all being quiet on Sunday morning, we procured some fuel from the farm of Hougamont, and then lighted fires and warmed ourselves our limbs being very much cramped sitting on the side of the wet ditch the whole night. The sergeant of each section gave a small piece of bread, about an ounce, to each man. An inquiry was made along the ranks for a butcher. One having gone forward, he was immediately ordered to kill a pig, there being cattle at the above-named farmhouse, which, having been slaughtered, was divided amongst the company, a portion of the head, in its rough state, being my share and having placed it upon the fire, the heat of which served to dry our clothing and accoutrements, and to cook our separate portion of meat, which having become warmed through and blackened with smoke, I partook of a little, but finding it too raw and unsavoury, having neither bread or salt, I put the remainder in my haversack, and taking my musket to put in order for action, which having been loaded the day previous, and the enemy not having disturbed us during the night, I discharged its contents at an object which the ball embedded in the bank where I had purposely placed it as a target. While so employed, we kept a sharp lookout on the enemy, who were no doubt similarly employed, at the same time having well attended to those things usual for a soldier to do in the presence of an enemy, when not actively engaged, examining the amount and state of ammunition remaining after previous engagements, also putting his musket in fighting trim well flinted and oiled. By the by, the flint musket then in use was a sad bore on that occasion. From the effects of the wet, the springs of the locks became wood-bound and would not act correctly. And when in action, the clumsy flints became also useless. The shortest way of amending these failures, which were very disheartening, was to make an exchange from those that were laying about amongst the slain. Being Sunday morning and well soaked in rain the previous night, I took from my haversack a change of linen which came to hand on passing amongst the dead bodies of some of our German allies who had fallen. The linen had been evidently wet from the wash and was homemade. Being now prepared for the day's encounter, I went to the farmyard of Hugomar for straw to sit upon, the ground being very wet. I entered the gates facing the wood into the farmyard, and on my left was a building in which was a quantity of dry straw. It being yet early in the morning, some of our troops were yet taking rest on the top of a mow. The whole of the left side of the farmyard appeared to be composed of buildings suitable for farming purposes, such as a well of water, sheds for wagons, and the whole presented a solid wall on the exterior, mostly loopholed. Having obtained what I thought would be useful to us in the orchard, I returned and found my comrades ready to receive a share of what I brought to them. Imagining that we should have to contend with the enemy on our present ground, and employed ourselves in clearing away branches on our side, and making clear openings through, by which means, without exposing ourselves, we could take more of a correct aim at the enemy. Whilst thus employed, we were quietly instructed to face to our right and march in the direction of Hugomo, known to us as the farmhouse. Passing the gates and round the upper corner of the building, our company led into a long and narrow kitchen garden, which was extended under cover of a close hedge, next to a cornfield, through which the skirmishers of the enemy were advancing to the attack. We remained in a kneeling position under this cover, but annoyed by a most galling fire from our opponent's guns to the left of our position so near to us, indeed, that the spreading of their small shots rarely escaped contact with our knapsacks and accoutrements, 
Even the heels of our shoes whilst kneeling were struck by them. We remained in this position for a considerable time, and the enemy, now advancing in greater force to attack the chateau, our commanding officer on his charger, remained on the road between the fence of the garden and the exterior wall of the farm to our rear, it being a higher position from whence he could more perfectly watch the movements of the enemy. The expected signal was given for us to retire from the garden. The front of the company was led by Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood, Captains Evelyn and Elrington, into the wood, I being in the rear subdivision on quitting the garden and reaching the road as above, Lieutenant Standen, with a very determined appearance, having his cap in one hand and his sword in the other, called our attention to join him and charge the enemy. We then went up the road towards the wood, the enemy skirmishers being under cover about the hedge, on the right of the wood. Our party took advantage of cover, myself and a man of the name of Argan, having taken our position under cover of a circular built stack from whence we fired on the enemy. Being earnestly engaged, the intervening objects were the cause of our not perceiving the movements and retreat of our comrades. Now left to ourselves, as we imagined, by not seeing anyone near us, and the enemy's skirmishers remaining under cover, continued firing at us. We likewise kept firing and retiring down the road at which we had advanced. We now halted. I unwisely ascended the height part of a sloping ground on which the exterior wall of the farm was built. Thinking of singling out the enemy's skirmishers more correctly, but very quickly found that I'd become a target for them, my red coat being more distinctly visible than theirs. Remaining in this position, I continued to exchange shots with the enemy across the kitchen garden, they having the advantage of the fence as a covering, their shots freely struck the wall in my rear. Our company from which we were separated had now opened a fire from within. My musket now proving defective, was very discouraging, but casting my eyes on the ground, I saw a musket, which I immediately took possession of in exchange for my old one. The new musket was warm from recent use, and proved an excellent one, it having belonged to the light infantry of first foot guards. My comrade during this time had more wisely contended with the enemy on the low ground by the garden fence, he being my senior by some years, and a very steady and undaunted old soldier and although I was but a youth, I felt as though I had partaken of his courageous spirit. Being still annoyed by the shots of the enemy, who were under good cover, we took advantage of a clover stack some distance off, and beyond the lower extremity of the farming premises from whence we exchanged several shots. My comrade now from his position by the stack apprised me of the enemy's advance to renew the attack, and supposing ourselves shut out from the farm, we were for a moment or two quite at a loss how to act, but on turning my eyes towards the lower gates, I saw that they were open, and at the same time apprising my comrades of so favourable an opportunity, we hastened towards that way, and before entering the farmyard, saw several of the wounded of our company making for the rear, amongst whom I distinguished Lieutenant Colonel Dashwood and Captain Evelyn of the same company, who were also wounded. On entering the courtyard, I saw the doors, or rather gates, were riddled with shot holes, and it was also very wet and dirty. In its entrance lay many dead bodies of the enemy, one I particularly noticed which appeared to have been a French officer, but they were scarcely distinguishable, being to all appearance as though they had been very much trodden upon and covered with mud. On gaining the interior, I saw Lieutenant Colonel Macdonnell carrying a large piece of wood or trunk of a tree in his arms. One of his cheeks was marked with blood, his charger lay bleeding within a short distance. Macdonald was hastening to secure the gates against the renewed attack of the enemy, which was most vigorously repulsed. I, being now told off with others under Lieutenant Gough of the Coldstream Guards, was posted in an upper room of the chateau, it being situated higher than the surrounding buildings. We annoyed the enemy's skirmishers from the window, which the enemy observing, threw their shells amongst us and set the building on fire we were defending. Our officer, placing himself at the entrance of the apartment, would not permit anyone to quit his post, until our position became hopeless and too perilous to remain. Fully expecting the floor to sink with us every moment, and in our escape several of us were more or less injured. The enemy's artillery, having forced the upper gates, a party of them rushed in, 
who were as quickly driven back, no one being left inside but a drummer boy without his drum, whom I lodged in a stable or outhouse. Many of the wounded of both armies were arranged side by side, having no means of carrying them to a place of greater safety. The upper gates being again made secure, a man and myself were posted under the archway for its defence, the enemy's artillery still continuing their fire. At length a round shot burst them open, stumps intended for firewood, laying within, were speedily scattered in all directions. The enemy not having succeeded in gaining an entry, the gates were again secured, although much shattered. After this we were posted to defend a breach made in the wall of the building, it being upstairs and above the gateway, the shattered fragments of the wall being mixed up with the bodies of our dead countrymen, who were cut down whilst defending their post. Being at this time under the command of Captain Elrington of my own company, I was then posted within a projecting portion of the ruin, on the opposite side of the breach was Sergeant Aston of my company. We kept a watchful eye upon the enemy, whose attacks now became less frequent as it was drawing towards the close of the action and the approach of evening. The firing shortly after ceased, and our complete victory being announced in our little garrison, we had a look around and saw the sad havoc the enemy has made of our fortress. The fire, unobstructed, continued its ravages, and having been unnoticed by us in the eagerness of the conflict, destroyed many of the buildings where many of the helpless wounded of both armies had been placed for security. On proceeding into a kind of kitchen, the wounded being arranged all around as far as possible from harm's way. About this time, some Belgian soldiers with others, who were looking out for their wounded or missing comrades, on seeing Frenchmen amongst the rest, began to menace the poor fellows with their bayonets, and would have acted violently towards them had we not have interfered on their behalf. On again going into the yard, it being evening, and perceiving a clear glowing fire rising from the ruins of a stable or some other outhouse, I took the opportunity of cooking the remaining portion of pork which I had stored away in my haversack as before stated, and after having placed it upon the fire and quietly awaiting its being cooked, discovered that the glow of fire arose from the half-consumed body of some party who had fallen in the contest. My meat, which was unsavoury in the morning, became much more so by its redressing. Having now found a little veal, smothered with dust and fragments of the broken ruins, but sufficiently cooked, I most gladly partook of it. I having no recollection of or having any other refreshment either on that or the previous day, with the exception of our ration of liquor whilst in the clover field, and a small quantity of bread we found at Quatre Bras amongst the slain. The evening now closing upon us, we were ordered to take a supply of fuel and to proceed up the hill in the rear of the farm. Agreeably to our instructions, myself with a man named Brooker proceeded together in a direction we were ordered, and arriving at a bank, being heavily loaded and nearly exhausted, we had very great difficulty in passing over it. On proceeding some short distance further, found our company, and were in time to answer to our names at the evening roll call. The sound of firing from the Prussians pursuing the retiring enemy now became fainter, and gradually became inaudible as they distanced us. We then lay on the ground in our blankets, and had a refreshing night's rest until daylight the following morning, when we were aroused by the accidental discharge of a musket, and in a sitting posture I contemplated for some minutes on the scene before me. Being on a hill, we had an extensive view of the field of action, a just description of which would baffle the skill of the cleverest writer or most proficient artist. Having now with others received orders to accompany a corporal to the burning ruins of Hougamont, which we found to be a more complete picture of destruction than we could have anticipated, here we saw numbers of soldiers in different regiments, all surrounding the only well of water known to us on the premises eagerly striving to obtain a drink of it, which had by this time become a mere puddle. And seeing no chance of obtaining any, we separated in the yard, and I proceeded up the yard, where on the heap of ruins lay the body of a comrade of the cold streams, from whose mess tin I took some biscuit, and turning to my left, entered the large garden, where I partook of some unripe fruit from a tree by the wall. On proceeding up the shaded avenue or garden walk, by the dead body of a Frenchman, I found a small portion of butter 
in a single stick basket, which having partaken of with my biscuit and being refreshed, returned again to the yard, and on my way was met by a large pig from the same direction. There immediately appeared in pursuit several English soldiers of different regiments, one of whom fired his musket and shot the pig whilst passing me, and each one in pursuit claimed a share, which I left them to decide. Having again joined the remainder of my party, we proceeded up the wood some distance, which was thickly strewn with the bodies of the slain. Many of our comrades being of the number, the heaps of the enemy slain lying about the exterior of the farm, showed the deadly effect of our fire from within. And on passing near to the site of the circular stack, as stated before, I found that it had been totally destroyed by the enemy's fire, and also that many of our comrades had fallen near the spot, and apparently entire, but on touching them, found them to be completely dried up by the heat. On passing down by the side of the garden we first entered, amongst the numerous bodies of the slain, was a wounded Frenchman in a sitting posture. Being unable to rise, we offered him our assistance, which he refused, and leaving him to his fate, we returned up the hill to our company, and soon equipped ourselves, and marching down the hill, we passed by a numerous group of our wounded, who had been placed together in a circular space for the convenience of a medical attendance and conveyance to the hospital. We then proceeded on our march, and having arrived at a small grass field in sight of Nivelle, we halted for the night, and bivouacked in the same, near to which was a rivulet, in which we cleansed ourselves from our uncomfortable state, caused by an excessive perspiration, marching through the clouds of dust bespattered with dirt, laying on the wet ground by night, biting off the end of cartridges, and being for many hours warmly engaged amongst burning fragments of destruction in the chateau of Hougamont. Now came the time for the distribution of rations, camp kettles all in requisition, and a general cooking along the hedgerows. The issue of rations liquor, and buzz of congratulating interchanges taking place with men of different companies, with their townsmen and old acquaintances, sitting or reclining on the ground, each listening to the narrative of his comrade, having been separated from each other during the contest. Had any of our inquiring friends in England been present in this said field in which was our bivouac, they would have listened with the deepest interest to the tales that were told on the night of the 19th of June, 1815.